Okay, well, welcome everybody. Um, thank you for coming to the first session for the MPH Career Development Series. Uh, my name is Patty, and I'm the one who coordinates these events. And I think by far this is the largest gathering we've had. So thank you for coming. Um, I'm going to take some time to um, introduce today's speakers. Uh, the topic today was graduate school, what you know, what you think you know, what you don't know but should. And uh, we actually have three of our professors here today. We have uh, Dr. Jennifer Griffith who is an alumni of the school, and she is the current evaluation manager for the Office of Special Programs, and also an assistant professor in the Health Policy and Management Department. And then we also have Dr. Adam Pickens, who is also an alumni of the school. He's a, an assistant professor in the Environmental and Occupational Health Department. And then we have Dr. Eva Shipp, who is an assistant professor um, in Epidemiology and Biostatistics. Okay, so today's topics, uh, the ones we're going to kind of highlight, and we can always add to these, um, we're going to uh, highlight on communication, professionalism, class and meetings, study habits, time management, and getting help, uh, the resources that are available to y'all here on campus and on main campus. So um, I guess in regards to communication, um, I'll go topic by topic, and they can give their input on those uh, topics. So you want to start off, Dr. Griffith? Oh, sure. Okay. Howdy, for those of you I haven't met in person, I'm Dr. Griffith, and really excited to see you all here. Um, I think we can all kind of commensurate on communication, so I'll, I'll just start off. I think there's nothing more disheartening for me when a student shows up at my door and wants to meet with me, and I can't, um, because I have other things scheduled, other meetings scheduled. So I think one word of advice I would give you about graduate school in general, and then also communicating with your professors, is to plan ahead as best you can and know that just because you show up and that person's in their office doesn't mean they're going to be able to work with you. So the best bet to make sure that you get the attention you need, get your questions answered, is to schedule an appointment. If you're scheduling, this is my personal preference, I don't know if Dr. Pickens and Dr. Ship have the same thing, but if you email me for an appointment, it's easier for me if you give me specific dates and times that work for you rather than just saying any time is free and then we have this chain of emails back and forth. If you just email and say, I'm free this time, this time, or this time, I can plug in and I'll send you an immediate calendar uh, meeting schedule. Um, same thing for phone. Um, sometimes if you call, I might still be able to answer. Excuse me, answer. But um, again, teaching is one of our many roles that we have. So there's often deadlines for projects and contracts and things that we're working on simultaneously. So for you to get the best attention for your questions and concerns, I think scheduling is extremely important. Uh, I, I absolutely would have to agree. And that echoes into one of our, I guess our next big bullet point is professionalism. You know, this moving into graduate school and, and particularly the public health is, is preparation for a professional career. And it's, it's not like you're going to get a MS in you know some laboratory based thing where you just sit in a lab all day you know this is a professional degree and so the scheduling and the and the conversation and with professors should be professional and we deal with each other in a professional manner and, and you know an email saying this is the times that I have that's exceedingly professional and and so maintain that level of professionalism um, as far as communication with, with faculty members go, I think most all faculty members have iPads and, and phones and whatnot now. So for me in particular, I, I know that most everybody else is busier than I am on any given day for most things. But even at my level of busy, you know, an, an email goes a long way. I, I have people that will see me walking around they say I tried to stop by your office you weren't there well you know I've got meetings throughout the day I don't just sit in my office all day and I don't think any faculty member does so electronic communication is exceedingly easy for us and and you know one thing Dr. Griffith touched on was the I am available these times can you meet those times you know that we get I mean, yesterday I got 186 emails, and most all of them needed some sort of attention. So I had to spend a lot of hours throughout the course of the day returning emails or attending to them. And so, therefore, if you can cut down on my number of emails, I'm more likely to 
you know, bend over backwards to help you out. So keep in mind that, again, teaching isn't our only activity. So make it easy on us to help you, I guess. So. Well, you guys didn't leave me a whole lot of other things. No, I'm kidding. I, I agree with everything that they both said. Um, one other thing I would probably add is that, and it's one of the bullet points when it comes to obtaining references, you know, the way you interact with us and your, the way you exhibit professionalism often goes into my letters of refer, recommendation or reference for jobs, for practica, for other experiences. So you really need to be mindful of how you present yourself to us because all of that gets bundled up in, in how we interact back with you as well as how we present you to other people for opportunities that you may want to pursue. Okay, well, thank you for those points. Um, and we want to go ahead and move on into professionalism. I don't know what else to <laughs> add, but um, I guess when also um, the way you interact with each other as well, um, when you're on group projects, when you're doing the capstone um, experience is a good time to learn good professionalism um, skills and how you communicate with each other and how you treat each other as, as colleagues. And in some of my upper level courses, we do a lot of cr critiques of each other's work as well as the general published literature. And that's another opportunity where you need to learn how to voice your opinions when they may not be glowing reviews of somebody, but you do it in a constructive and productive fashion. And learning how to pick up those skills now while you're in graduate school, if you haven't already, is going to really serve you well when you go out to do your practicum, and especially um, on the job, or if you go on to pursue another doctoral degree. Uh, yes, I, I had the, the same thought about the group projects. Um, I think most faculty members now have some sort of group work in most of their courses, and, and particularly now with the capstone being a group project throughout the court full course of a semester you know really what we have, have tried to talk about as faculty is how to prepare you to go out into the workforce because very few workforces you go out into are going to be a silo you know you're not going to work by yourself and so we're trying to give you the opportunity to work with other people of, of similar or different disciplines and to come up with a good result and and grow your professionalism skills. You know, I, I, even last semester in the spring, I had several people stop by my office and they said, you know, they were complaining about a group project or a group project in another course and whatever. You know, take it as a learning experience. I mean, you're, you're in school to learn and treat your colleagues, treat, I mean, if you look at this as a work environment, you know, we would be your superiors in, in the, vertical chain of command, so to speak. You know, treat your colleagues, treat us with a certain level of professionalism, and take this opportunity to grow not only your knowledge base, but your interaction with your colleagues as from a professional level. Okay. I was just going to jot down a note, because uh, there are a couple of things that Dr. Ship and Dr. Perkins both said that I want to tag on to. You've entered a professional program, so this is different than undergrad. Um, a lot of folks come in focused on, I've got to get an A, I've got to get an A. And when we talk about doing group projects or even individual projects and you're getting feedback and critique, there's a certain level of learning how to accept that type of feedback and critique. We're not doing this to be mean. We're doing this to further develop you as a professional. And Dr. Schiff and I just worked on a contract not too long ago where we were editing and critiquing each other's work, and it ended up producing a very good product, but part of our development process as professionals was learning how to communicate that and accept it. So that's an extremely important skill to learn. Um, on top of the difference between, I touched on the difference between undergrad and grad school, and Dr. Perkins mentioned this as well, this is kind of a work environment and you're developing a skill set as well as generating a knowledge base because the issues we tackle in public health today may not be the same issues we tackle 10 years from now. So you're developing tools and skills, and part of being a professional is keeping your horizons open and continuing to learn. So yes, we want you to get good grades, but building a strong foundation and understanding 
public health practice and, and building on those tools is as important. The grades will come if you're doing that level of work. The grades come with that. That's how the courses are designed. I actually have a follow-up to that, and, and I thought about this prior. But you mentioned critiquing your colleagues' work. You know, I mean, we do it all the time. I mean, we don't work alone. So, I mean, even I've done several things, and we have to critique each other's work. And I, I think that's something that, that you all need to learn. I mean, I, I have several group projects in the course I teach in the spring, and I'm sure you all are the same way. You know, you get students coming to you saying, so-and-so isn't doing very good work will take this opportunity to say this work isn't up to par with the rest of the group. You know, learn how to treat them as professionals and say you're doing work that's subpar. Can we help you with it? Take the opportunity to help your colleagues. Again, professional environment. And, you know, I mean, we get good results out of whenever we work together. And it's because, you know, I critique Eva's work and she critiques mine and, and we produce good products because of it, and I expect y'all to do the same. You know, whenever it comes to the end of the semester and you turn in one group project, you know, we have, I give out evaluations and, and say, how did each individual do? You know, and if you wait to tell me then that so-and-so didn't do very well on the second assignment, you know, I can't change their grade from an A to a B because of that. I can, you know, give each individual a little bit different grade, but you know, really you're, you're hamstringing me and you're hamstringing yourself. So help them become better professionals, help them to do better, so. Tag one more thing on that, because I saw under professionalism writing and talking about critiquing. How many people think that when we sit down to write a paper, we do it in one evening and it's perfect? Yeah, no, I haven't, I, I've, I've known one person that could do that, and he was a journal editor and he'd been at this field for over 45 years. So yeah, by the time I met him, he could sit down and write an editorial or response in one evening and it, it was pretty darn good. Maybe had a word change here or there. So part of becoming a professional is recognizing that to do quality work, you need to start and you need to edit. And when I talk about editing, I, I'm not talking about, okay, I just finished writing my paper and now I'm gonna go immediately back in and start editing it. Have you ever seen the email where it's a jumbled mess of words, but you're still able to read it because the first letter and last letter of each word? Your eyes play tricks on you. So when you're doing writing, um, I have a couple of tricks I always give to students. First one is read it out loud because your ears going to catch something your eyes won't. Your eyes see what they think they should see. Also, read your assignments backwards. Okay, I'm not talking about going, you know, backwards from the end of the <laughs> sentence. But this is how you tell if you have complete sentences. If you read the last sentence of a paragraph by itself, do I have all the pieces? Does it make sense? Because if each piece can stand alone, when you put them together, you're going to have really tight work. And that's what we really hope you get. So part of that professionalism on top of critiquing is recognizing that a lot of the assignments you're asked to do are processes. They're not a one-shot deal where you can sit down the night before and produce what we expect as quality work. It's going to take a little bit of time and effort. Um, I'm glad you touched on the writing um, because I know that I, whenever I was an undergrad um, and then I came into this program, I was a heavily science-based program. I was a BIMS major on main campus. So we hardly ever did writing. All we did were labs, labs, labs. And so I know some of you may have that same background to where it was just very science-based and very clinical. So whenever you come here, I mean, you're having to write so many papers. I was social and behavioral, so every class was nothing but papers. And um, one resource I want to share with you, um, you might know about it if you came from in campus. If you didn't, um, it's the Writing Center. Um, I know they have certain uh, office hours, and I'll move, our, move over to the next slide. Um, I'll provide you with the uh, address for that. But you can always go to them for help if you need in writing. Um, or, or, or if you need some help in structuring your paper, or you maybe don't really have a very good guide on it, um, you know, there's never any shame in asking for help if you've never had to do that before. So I'm glad you touched base on that. And I know that you as professors, having to read pa tons and tons of papers, um, you, know, you catch a lot of those issues with writing.
So um, I know we talked about references. Did y'all want to add anything else on that? Or I want to add one more thing to writing because you made me think of this, bringing up the writing center. <laughs> and when you're in an undergrad situation, oftentimes you're given, I don't want a five page double space paper. I want a paragraph or a single page. I give page targets for assignments, but I'm really looking for the content to address the, what's being asked in the assignment versus quantity. Quality over quantity is always better. And I had a student, I'll never forget this, two semesters ago that emailed me in a panic because their final paper for my class was 35 pages long, double spaced. I said, submit it. I'm not going to stop reading it page 15, submit it. That paper read so smoothly and was so well done that 35 pages of good quality content is fine. If it's 15 pages of subpar quality and it makes me kind of go, oh. I always say if I get stopped when I'm reading that's kind of like, oh, wait, wait, okay, wait a second, okay, pick up again and go again. So while we give those types of things as targets, good quality often is more important than hitting a page limit or maintaining a page limit. Now, I, that's my perspective. I don't like getting 35 page papers on, 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 you know, as a usual thing, but this was a really well done paper. I mean, this was something this student could have taken and probably had published. So, you know, keep that in mind that it's not so much about quantity as it is quality. Um, <laughs> this, this, it's about the writing center. I, I completely agree. Um, but one thing I always tell students who ask me for help with writing and, and you know they've been to the writing center and one of the complaints I've heard about the writing center is they they take long to turn it around one thing I want to tell you and this this echoes one thing Dr. Griffith said don't have it be a night before it's due type thing you know they they run in the same cycle that you run you know it Everybody tries to turn in their paper the week before it's due and have the writing center do it. So they just have an influx of, of you know, a thousand papers within a couple of days. And they, you know, they can't get to them all within, you know, a couple hour turnaround. So give them some lead time. It'll, it'll help you by starting writing earlier and you get more of their, their access and their time. So you're not freaking out because you don't have the writing center's critique on your paper. You know, you have it a week before everybody else turns it in. So, again, that gets you started writing sooner. It gets you more of a critique time, and it gets you a little bit of a less headache. I mean, you don't have to worry about getting a good paper done the last couple of days. I mean, I'm, it's, again, they work on the same cycle you do. So, Just one other thing, it seems... I almost feel silly saying this, but don't underestimate the value of, a, of an outline. <laughs> I, by nature, I'm very sympathetic to writers. I am not, by nature, a talented writer. I have had to struggle. And people used to tell me, you need to write an outline. You need to write an outline. And I used to be like, I don't want to write an outline. It's a pain in the butt. But seriously, that's what has made me a better writer, is that and reading things in, in reverse. And um, I thought, when I first heard that suggestion, I thought that, because it was in a grantsmanship workshop, and I thought the person was absolutely insane. But then I did it, and it was like, whoa, you found out, I mean, very quickly where the problems were in your paragraphs. So I really cannot stress those, those things enough. Okay, so we'll move on to um, class and meetings and what you expect from your students um, in that type of setting. Um, <laughs> this is an external conversation that happened before we started. Um, for class, it, you know, again, it, it echoes back, everything echoes back for me to professionalism. Show up on time, don't be late, come ready for class. You know, we, I don't know of any class that is in SRPH that doesn't give you something to do beforehand. You know, a, a reading, a paper, an assignment, a, anything. You know, we post it on Blackboard, we email it to you, you know, we give it to you in 10 different media types. Come prepared to class. You know, I, it's, I, I can't stress that enough. I, and, and come on time. You know, I, whenever I was a young professional, you know, I think most of us have worked outside of faculty jobs. And so, 
you know, I was a professional, and whenever I was a young professional, I came to a meeting late because my other meeting got out late. But the guy running the meeting, I was 30 minutes late for an hour-long meeting. He asked me to leave. And, you know, it was just because it was unprofessional of me to show up halfway through the meeting. And, you know, I, I like to have morning classes. I've got an afternoon class this semester. I, I've asked people to leave, you know. They show up an hour and a half late for a three-hour class. I just ask them to not come in because if it's not important enough for you to show up on time, it's not important enough for me to give you that information. You know, you you obviously don't care enough to get there at nine o'clock for a nine o'clock class. But it all echoes back to professionalism for me. You know, treat this as a professional setting because that's what it is. Just to t tag on to that, it takes a lot of time, my time and effort, to put together a good lecture. So I expect you to put that same effort into my class when I ask you to do something. Unless, I mean, I'm happy to get up in front of you guys and just blah, 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 and not, you know, that'd be boring for both of us. So I put a lot of time and energy. Sometimes it may be more obvious than others. But, you know, it really, it takes a tremendous amount of effort to put a good class session together, especially when it's three hours in length and try and keep both of us engaged for three hours. So that, it, that being said, if you want a good experience from me, then you need to put the same amount of effort into your assignments and to being prepared for class. I've got a story. Can I tell a story? Yeah, you can tell okay. a story. I've got a story for you. Eggs. i got a little story for you, Eggs. So, um, the, the putting the effort in, you know, I, I especially now that I'm a, we're teaching graduate school, I, I used to teach undergrad. And undergrads don't want to do anything. I mean, y'all, it's true, they don't want to do anything. And the first semester I'd ever taught, I was a, a doctoral student. McAllen, does somebody have the mic on? Somebody want to make a comment or? Or not. <laughs> okay, so I was putting a lot of work into getting my lectures prepared and be, being ready for class and having a lot of information and a lot of examples and, you know, engaging the students. And then after the first test, there were things that I had told them, you need to know this, like in class, this is going to be on the test. And then whenever I get to the test, everybody got a zero on that certain <laughs> element. The, I had talked to other faculty members and everybody said, yeah, it's going to be an easy test. You should have an average of about an 80, 85. And I was like, all right. And I got there and the test average was 34. <laughs> And it was things, like, I gave them an anatomy sheet, and I said, learn this anatomy. And, like, one person in the whole class got one right. That was it <laughs> on, the, on the entire page. And so as I was sitting there grading, I just kept getting more and more angry. So the next day, the next class period, as I hand out the test, like, I basically proceeded to yell at them for an hour and tell them how, <laughs> how lazy they were and all this stuff. And, and it, it really just stems from the fact that, you know, I, it, you may not think it, but we do put a considerable amount of effort into like every lecture that we do to get the content in there, to get something that will engage you and that you find interesting that we still think you need to know. And so keep that, you know, keep that in mind. You know, put forth, you know, you don't have to spend several hours a week just for my one lecture, but put forth at least, you know, a high water mark for lecture because again, you know, we, we do anticipate that you put forth some sort of effort, just like we do. So. I had a faculty member once tell me that sitting in a chair and converting oxygen to carbon dioxide is not participation. <laughs> so just keep that in mind. Uh, I, I, have, I have two things on, on classes and meetings that kind of tie onto this. I, I, I don't want to ask y'all to show hands, but think about this. How many of you have truly read every single page of every course syllabus you've been given this semester. That is your guidebook to success in this class or whichever class it is. If you are a professional in the field, your, your boss is not going to tell you step by step what to do with this job. Again, you're learning professional skills, so there's some expectation that you have initiative to do what's being set forth in front of you. So when it comes to classes and meetings, be sure that you read the syllabus. Um, I oftentimes will respond to emails about when something's due or something along those lines. 
I don't know if y'all know, but putting together a course syllabus, it's like putting together a lecture. And then there's always gonna be a little typo here and there, and we try our best, but you know, we are human. We do, we do err on those types of things. On top of you know, being a professional and showing up to class or participating in class, you're paying for this. You have paid to be here. So get your money's worth. Make sure that you show up on time and that you're engaged. And if you do have questions, ask them. You know? But if it's something that you should have gotten from reading the syllabus, don't be surprised if you get a response that says, have you read the syllabus page five? You know, anything like that. Because part of this, too, is showing that you are a professional and somewhat self-sufficient and a self-starter, that you're able to you know, take direction and initiative and move forward on that. Those are the only two thoughts I had. I've got another one. Oh, good. <laughs> um, See, we work well together. Yeah. yeah. Um, one of the things, talking about the questions, you know, I, we sit up here and as we're lecturing in class, you know, we're looking at y'all. I, I don't know any professor who turns their back and stares at the screen and just lets y'all do whatever you want to do. Yeah, most professors are going to stand there and talk to you. I mean, that's what we're here to do is talk to you about the information that we need to give you. We look at all your faces, and I can say from personal experience, whenever I, I mean, I get into some fairly technical subjects in my area, and whenever I've got a, a math equation that's, you know, taken up half the screen, and there's 10 different variables on it, and, you know, I look out there and I say, does anybody have any questions? And everybody is just stone-faced, and you shake your head, and, like, I sit there for, you know, 10 minutes explaining this, how it is, the variables, the applications, how you use it, even gone over an, an, an example or two, and I look out there and you're just like, I know you've got questions. I, I know you do. And, I, and there's 10 of you out there that may have the same question because there's 10 of you looking like, <laughs> you know, okay? Just ask the question. It's okay. I mean, it's not going to hurt our feelings that, you know, maybe we didn't explain something good enough or put it in a language you can understand or whatever. It's not going to hurt our feelings if you ask a question. So ask it. And I, I heard this whenever I was a graduate student. I guarantee you in a class of 20 people, if you've got a question, there's at least five other people that have the same question. So be the one to ask the question. It's, again, you're going to help your classmates out. You're going to help us out in finding a better way to tell it to you. Yeah, because it's because of the types of questions I get, I, it helps me understand what I'm not being clear on, you know? Lots of times in my head, yes, everything's perfectly wonderful. And then uh, eight people ask me the same thing. I was like, oh, okay, I really screwed that up. I better redo it. So it, it goes both ways. Um, moving on to study habits uh, as students and now as uh, professors, what are some good study habits or, um, that you would give the students? I'll go back to reading the syllabus and setting up a schedule. Um, we have technology now, but back in the old days when dinosaurs still roamed the earth, we had these lovely little calendars that we used to get on main campus that not only had the holidays, we had the holidays, those are really important, but having a schedule and, and kind of sticking to that and, and making sure that you know what's due when, we try not to make this painful, but you are in a professional program, and because public health is such a diverse field, there's a lot of information to cover. We don't work in silos, so you have to know a little bit of everything and then focus in on your concentration a little more. So there's going to be a lot of reading, and I remember a lot of reading, but I don't know if you all realize that the readings that you all do for class, most of the time we're rereading those to make sure that it's fresh in our minds. So we're doing that too. And it may seem like a lot of reading, so you'll have to figure out the best tips and tricks that will help you get through all of the requirements for your course. Um, we work really hard to keep those limited, but there is a lot of information to cover. The thing that worked for me, I had, I had and I would probably say I still do have horrible study habits. I am terrible. I was terrible as a student. I was terrible as an undergrad. I was terrible as a master's student. I was terrible as a doctoral student. I am a terrible studier. I am not good at it, and I openly admit it. But what I finally found that worked for me is schedules. Schedule, schedule, schedule. Um, you've all got iPads now. You've, they're all tied into your webmail accounts. 
you can set up reminders. I have got reminders that go off for me from my webmail on my calendar that go off all throughout the day, and it is it is invaluable to me. You know, it, I don't schedule every little detail of my day, but knowing when things are due, you know, if I've got something due next Friday, I will set a reminder for this Wednesday, and uh, you know, schedule, schedule, schedule. For me, that's the only thing that works because. If I just leave it up to, you know, <laughs> I've got a two-year-old, and if we have free play time, uh, <laughs> if I have free play time, I won't get anything done. You know, I will look at YouTube and Hulu, and, and you know, I'll do, I'll play on my iPad. I've got great games on my iPad. I've got a thousand things that I would rather do besides, you know, study. study you know, and so that is my tip to you: is schedule, schedule, schedule. I'm like Dr. Pickens. I am horrible with time management, and I marry, happen to marry somebody who schedules every freaking thing, and I thought, oh my God, this guy's <laughs> nuts. How am I ever going to live with this? But the truth of the matter is I'm doing it now, and I'm more, way more efficient, so I have more time to have fun and do non-work things. So I, as much of a same thing with outlines, like I had to learn, force myself to do it. I hate it. I don't enjoy scheduling. It's not my nature. But man, does it pay off in the long run? I would say I'm the odd person up here. I love schedules, and <laughs> I tell you what, timelines and task lists. And if you ever work with me on a project, you'll find out I love color coding. Absolutely love color coding. It's like the best thing ever. Keep me organized. I am a little bit of a type A. What was that? Yes, the syllabus is color coded. <laughs> and does it help? It helps me. I don't know. So you have to find what works for you. Um, I guess we kind of mixed in the study habits and time management, but they really go hand in hand. I think one thing I would add on top of time management, and I think Dr. Schiff alluded to this just now, when you set yourself up for success by organizing your time, you will find that you actually are more efficient. And part of being a well-rounded grad student is having a well-rounded life. So making sure that you, you take time for yourself and that you, you don't just bury yourself in the books. If a friend's calling, you can go to a movie. You don't do it the night if you have a paper due and your paper's not ready. But make sure that you do take that kind of time. And the only thing I would say about time management, we have a lot of online courses. And I know that if you take 601, you hear this in my intro lecture. So I'm sorry if I'm you know saying it again and again, but I can't say it enough. If that were a live course, you would be sitting in front of me for three hours. So you really need to schedule time appropriately. Um, putting everything to the weekend, that cuts into probably your fun time. And let's face it, I'm a football fan. I was busy watching football last night, I admit it. I'm going to be watching football on Saturday. So there's no chance that I'm going to be working on things when I'm at the football game. So make sure that you do that for yourself. It really pays off in the end. As we have more and more online classes, some of them are s more synchronous, some of them are more asynchronous. So like for my intro epi class, you can take, uh, you've got to complete everything within a week's time. Each module is about a week, week, in, week in length. And so everything's due on a Friday or a Monday. Okay, I love questions I, and sometimes I'm better at answering than others and I, and I have rules about that that I go over at the beginning of the class. But I'm not sitting in front of my computer 24-7 waiting for your, your, your question. So I need at least, I need 24 hours to get, when we're, for those online courses, um, I, we try and answer questions. Sometimes we're not good at it, I admit it, and we make accommodations if we haven't done that. But again, the, the point being with the online classes that you're not sitting in front of your computer waiting for my email 24-7, so we're not either. But just want to point that out. Um, sorry, I was finding a form. Um, but. Um, uh, about getting help, any other tips regarding that? Um, like having students come to y'all, I know you said that if you had issues, um, to make sure that they schedule a meeting with you, um, try to do it as far out as possible and um, make sure they give you certain times, but anything else? I think the only other thing that I could add, and this kind of goes back to the online course piece, is that we have experts. We've got one in the back of the room. Stephen can wave. He, he does our Adobe Connect and iPad. Ryan Weber helps us with Blackboard. You, we're, we're good at the fields we were trained in. And if we're doing an online course or working with technology, we're usually pretty savvy with what we're working with. But there are some issues that we can't tackle. So 
don't be discouraged if you contact us and say, I'm having this problem with my computer and I can't get this set. We don't have the answer to that because chances are we probably won't. Now, I've been teaching online courses now for four years and I, I've kind of seen it all to some extent, but then we get a new version so something else crops up. So I can't, you know, how many people had the Epi transition module thing this week? And yeah, we got it fixed on Tuesday, but those little things happen. So do let me know, but getting help for those kinds of things, sometimes going to the instructor, the professor, isn't the best person to go to. Um, IT and different folks within the school and within the Health Science Center have that expertise. So while your faculty is one area of expertise, the staff and the support teams, student affairs, academic affairs, information technology are just as important to you as a student as, as we are. They, they oftentimes can help you navigate the, the functional and organizational issues that will make you more effective in class. Um, I know it's getting close to 12 and there is one class um, this afternoon, so um, if you do need to get that to that class, um, I would just make sure that since we're talking about class and being on time that you do get there on time. But um, if you aren't, we're going to go ahead and open the floor for uh, questions now. Um, if you do exit, if, you'd if you would please uh, sign in and drop off any forms up at the front. And then, um, so if, does anybody have a question? McAllen, do you have a question down there? Or go ahead. I, I can um, relate. I would say one important thing would be to look at your syllabus because if you have somebody guest lecturing, that could be a potential employer. Also, we do have shower facilities here. I'm just saying, if, if, if <laughs> hold on, hold on. If, if it's a case where you have, you have that situation but you know that somebody's coming, there, there is a way to freshen up if you so desire. But I would say more often than not, it's okay, but I would, I would check the syllabus and, and just be, be aware that things like this, there are going to be people that come in that could be potential employers, and every impression you give is something that's building that professional image that, that you have. So you know, use that to whatever extent that's helpful. I, I agree. Uh, for me, I, I just care that you're here. Uh, for, for my lectures, I just want you to be in the seat um, and show up on time. You know, if what you're wearing, it matters not to me. But I will say, you know, we all bring in guest lectures within the field. And for our department, uh, you know, we have external things that companies come in to talk to you about the company or you know, tell you about a certain field or whatnot, or, or like we have, uh, no, everybody has it, but we have ASSE, and, you know, we bring in guests to talk about certain things. Don't show up to that wearing workout clothes. You know, um, they're always looking for interns or may have a job opening, and if you come up in workout clothes and somebody else comes up dressed professionally, you know, who's going to get the better weight? You know, that it, it's sad but true. And, you know, show up to things where you could gain more than just knowledge. I mean, you know, class is class. Be there. Participate. That's fine. You know, wear whatever you want. But, you know, a guest lecture or something like that. Or an organizational meeting where they're bringing somebody in from outside. Absolutely professional. And there's a cold front coming through this weekend. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> so that, yeah. Any other questions? <clears throat> McAllen, are there any questions down there? No. <laughs> any comments? <laughs> All righty, well, thank you very much for coming. I'm